So, um, as I was saying, Tony Hawkstad is the new, newly appointed representative for the Northampton Housing Authority. So, good well. luck. And we have another guest, Clem um, Clay, who is the new executive director. Is that your title of Grow Food Northampton? So, Clem, are you just here? Would you like to make a presentation or tell us where you've been? Uh, yes. We should, we should oh, yes, I'm sorry. She's been watching all of us on the <laughs> <laughs> All right, no. Just we'll, we'll just introduce it. And then, that, sure. and then we can also introduce ourselves to Clem as we go. Okay. So, Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, Brian Adams. <laughs> Deb and Bruce, um, and I, I'm here because I sit on planning board, so they make me sit here. <coughs> Linda Morley. Uh, Downey Meyer, and Conservation Commissioner Representative. Dave Frosty. Glenn Connolly from the Recreation Commission. I'm David Drake from the Historical Commission. And I'm Sam Great. Well, thanks for having me. And I, I think I'm officially just here in the public comment period. I will be brief. I mostly wanted to come and introduce myself to you all and um, express my gratitude uh, to the commission for the support uh, that it's provided in the past for Growth Food Northampton. And just to, so you could put a face for the name or uh, know that there's been a transition in leadership at Growth Food Northampton. Many of you, I'm sure all of you, have uh, worked with Lily Lombard in the past. So uh, I'll just briefly mention that I was before this body about five years ago, Sarah might remember this, um, working for the Trust for Public Land and working on the acquisition of the Bean and Alec Farms, which couldn't have happened without community preservation funds. Um, and so I do have a history with this this project and with Grow Food Northampton, even though at that time Grow Food Northampton didn't actually exist and, and we didn't know as the Trust for Public Land that we would be selling the protected farmland piece of that project to Grow Food Northampton. So it's a nice sort of full circle story for me to uh, to now have made the transition from uh, working for the Trust for Public Land to working for Grow Food Northampton and to be able to return to, to this great project. Uh, the piece that I missed in all of that was the Community Preservation uh, Committee's funding of this grant for the community garden and the build out of the community garden. So that's, uh, that's the, the support that we've had most recently from you and that I'm learning a lot about and uh, trying to really understand what it means to be in charge of a community garden and um, so there are a lot of really interesting aspects to that and I'm, I may be coming back here at some point in the future uh, to discuss things further. I know we've extended our uh, grant with you into the, through 2015 to sort of build out at a reasonable pace where at this point I'm putting together our budget for the year and expecting to spend that grant down in 2015 but I hope if we if it turns out that spending it down isn't the best thing that I can maybe come back before you and and discuss a further extension but my hope is that we will we will continue to, to build out some infrastructure out there with the support of community preservation funds and sort of finish out uh, this this phase of of the work out there uh, and currently our plans to do that include uh, building a, a couple of covered structures so there's uh, more shade more opportunity for people to to gather possibly some tools uh, and plant swapping more more plant than tool um, probably but sort of opportunities for people to do things in the shade or undercover uh, if it's raining that we currently don't really don't really have as you know we've, we've um, completed our outhouse project out there and uh, has good storage and so on. We're also going to be building out 46 more 20 by 20 plots this year. So uh, we'll be up to uh, 78 or something like that. Um, so making great progress. We uh, have just completed the 2015 registration packet that's going to be going out for returning gardeners to pre-register uh, uh, by the end of the month. We'll do registration at the end of March and get rolling for another another good season. So, again, I just wanted to say hello um, and thank you for the support that's uh, made it possible for for us to build out what I, what I think is really a great asset for the community. And um, you know, welcome feedback to me anytime. Clem at GrowFoodNorthampton.com or give us a call. We actually have a, a phone number now on our website and. Um, and so I'd be happy to hear from any of you individually or come back and uh, answer questions or discuss anything related to the community garden aspect of, of our work um, at any time. But 
I don't want to take up too much of your time now. So listen, if you have any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them, yeah, it's, given it's, that I've only been here a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, welcome. It's not a question. I just wanted to say that Gabby grabbed me by the ear at the end of summer, and I spent a whole morning at the garden. It's very impressive. Thank you. The, uh, the outhouse was running. I went through the tool shed. I love the way you've incorporated places for kids to play. It, 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 was, it was really pretty impressive. Well, thank you. And um, any of you who haven't been there, I encourage you to come and would be happy to arrange a, an actual tour for committee members if that's something that would be of interest. It's certainly, uh, you know, that's something we could try to maybe get a, get a reporter out for, too, uh, if, if necessary. I think it's, it's valuable for folks to know that there are ongoing benefits from CPA investments. Great. Thank you very Thanks much. Very I appreciate much. your time. Thank you. Next on the agenda is approval of some minutes. We have November 19th, two thousand fourteen. The only thing I have, sir, is that a member's present. I'm not listed on that. I was actually at that meeting. I'm in the body, so I just feel a little better if I was I, I will add you. Thank you. That, that is important. I don't think I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I popped up a couple of times since you said. Okay, so we have a motion to end a second. Okay. All right. And just, <clears throat> we only got them yesterday at 2 o'clock, so it's not something else for all day and not enough time to really review it. We have any commitments I just assume the table to do it. Um, so is that what they moved to post at home? So there's no objection. Yes. Um, I have no objection to that, but I um, I was glad to see that the issue of getting the minutes posted um, was raised because as I was out, I was looking for the minutes and trying to find out about what was happening and, and, and they really weren't there. So and the whole issue, obviously, of public access to what's going on is, is, has been raised recently. So I, I know it's a it's a it's a hard task, but I just want to underscore the importance of being able to to do these and, and get them done timely so they're available. To Oh, but I agree, it's, there wasn't really enough time. Can so. we try, Sarah, to get these out, you know, either a week before or sometime with the prior week so that we can actually think about it and get the comments and you can incorporate them and bring them back so we can all consider them? Sure. Yeah, um, refresh me. I think our answer to someone raising the issue about the minutes was they're there, but they're hard to get to. Is, is there any... I have not looked online. It was it was twofold. For 2014, we are behind. For 2013 and previous, they are in a very different place, but they are completely okay. okay. So I added a note to the website. Okay. If you're looking for That's what I'm looking previous for. minutes, so, so there was a note that way. redirected someone to find what yeah. was there that was yeah. hard to find. Okay. <clears throat> okay so, um, so we would postpone this to our. Okay, without objection. So we'll come back to um, the November, I'm sorry, the December minutes. I'm just going to bring them up so anyone has a chance to kind of address those and get that incorporated. Um, so this is the December 3rd consideration meeting. Anybody have amendments that they would like to make to these? Sir, I just noted in the lumberyard affordable housing discussion, there was some garblement near the end, um, which is we had an amendment proposed amendment proposed to um, not allow window mounted air conditioners, which um, failed. And uh, David would be happy to know that when I was at the meeting on the 29th, that they, the architect actually said that there would be no window mounted air conditioners. There will be none. Okay, good. There will be none. So that's. Uh, um, but then I didn't 
see where our meeting on the 29th occurred. I think that's where it says day period accepted as an amendment to the original motion. So, okay. Yeah. So we need to just add there the meeting with the public that was conditioned for 15 days prior, which did pass an amendment motion. So again, we're going to act on these at our next meeting after everyone has had a chance to make any changes or suggest changes to Sarah so she can incorporate them and bring them to us at our next meeting. Sarah, I just want to ask along the lines of that. So when I look at the city site, I'm seeing January and April as being up. Um, are the minutes, and this, I'm looking at the the Janice Medicine Downloads tool? Yes, some of those have been approved, but I was I was trying to get them up today but, and having issues with it. Okay. But I'll, for the next meeting, I'll make sure we're up to date completely. Okay, is that in the order, are we talking about five sets or four sets? Yeah. Or, okay. Right okay, so it will be good for us to catch up with that. All right, so the next item is the chair's report. Um, did all of you get the email from the coalition regarding the newest legislative strategy? Tony, you may have not. Um, so the Community Preservation Coalition, which is sort of, we pay them dues to lobby for us, um, they had attempted to write a perpetual $25 million appropriation out of surplus, which failed because the Department of Revenue said that they couldn't bind a, a, you know, a future legislature to that um, promise. So then the $25 million arrived the first year, didn't arrive this year. Um, so their new solution is to increase the primary source, which is the recording fees, to a level that will ensure a 50% match. So that's their long-term solution. Um, and the short-term solution is to try to get the $25 million. But, so I think that if we, um, I would not expect, I would expect Peter Cocott would be supportive of this. Um, Stan sometimes does, Stan Rosenthal sometimes does odd things because he's in leadership. Sometimes he doesn't like to sign on to bills because he feels like that favors them. But an email or call would, I think, be helpful. Um, the idea that they would raise the transaction fee on the real estate, that, that's what I took from that, right? That's, yeah, that's the long, the long term fix is, you know, now knowing that they can't get the $25 million or they don't have any guarantees right. that they would like to adjust the reporting fee. So, um, I'm under the impression we aren't transacting nearly as many properties as we used to. So how, how is that projected to be 50% that just make up the shortfall? I can see how it would increase fees, but it's an increase in a fee that happens in an unknown occurrence in the future of every year. Right. I think they're going to, I think what happened is when the act was first approved that they, it was like the allocation of the Colorado River. It was a, a particularly flush time and so they decided we'll get this revenue stream and I think they're probably going to be either pessimistic or use more realistic experience when there's not a property bill. But there's no guarantee if they pick this that they would get that. Okay. And to clarify. <clears throat> the recording fees are then lump sum and then divided among all the town scoring formula, or do we only get that portion, which is no, no, they're thing? they're lump sum. They're all they are all put into the trust fund that is then used to distribute the matches. And the one thing about the recording fees is that this additional fee is a fee that goes on, and it's not graduated by the size of the transaction. So whether you're doing a deed for a million dollar house, which would have a large recording fee, and then you tack on the CPA fund, you know, CPA additional cost, um, or whether you're just doing um, a municipal certification uh, of no liens present, you still have the same fee. So it's a little bit regressive in structure, but that's the way it's created. So that is um, one thing. Um, the other thing that is significant is uh, when we're, our recommendations went up to City Council. All but one of them passed without significant discussion. Um, the one that you may have read that is still in 
limbo at this point is our recommendation for $300,000 for the lumber yard. Um, so they postponed it once and they have postponed it again. Um, I was at both meetings. The rationale for uh, that Councillor Carney gave was that she didn't feel comfortable voting for CPA funding in the face of vehement opposition. Um, and the rationale that um, Councillor Barge gave was that she was not, there was something about the process that she, at this point, was not comfortable with going ahead to vote. So, um, again, it's likely that they would look to taking two votes on February 5th because they understand that the um, DHCD funding round, the one stop application, <coughs> is likely to be due in February. Um, so, I would expect them to take two votes. So, um, your presence or your um, just you know, sending them an email or a letter or a phone call, I think, um, would be would be good because at this point, I think that uh, you know one one of the, one of the complications is that they need six votes since it's an appropriation. So even though they had five votes versus two at the last meeting, it would have failed because they didn't have the six votes since um, David Murphy is conflicted out and. Councilor Spector was not there. So that is um, still still in process. Explain why David Murphy was conflicted out again. I couldn't uh, probably <laughs> land ownership. I mean he did not disclose the reason for the conflict, but he recused himself from consideration. And my guess is that he's involved as the real estate yeah. agent right. on the sale. Right. It is a personal gain potentially for this transaction. So, um, so that is that is where that stands um, at the moment. But other than that item, they were very pleased. And is there anything, is there anything else that's come up administratively? Oh, I should say the meeting that we mandated on the 29th was held at the Collaborative for Education Services on Holly Street. It was um, well attended by the majority, by you know, a good number of neighbors and. The majority of the council, and I would characterize that meeting as consisting of um, a smaller number of residents of the neighborhood who remain strongly opposed to the project for reasons of scale, for reasons of parking impact, traffic impacts, um, and a, a larger group that was supportive or at least not do not force significant opposition. And what I noticed at that meeting is that some of the some of the people who had spoken out at the CBAC, uh, for instance, Tom Douglas, who um, owns a building nearby, he is an architect and he spoke um, approvingly of the changes that had been made to the design. Um, and subsequent to that meeting, it was actually um, approved by Central Business Architecture Committee and by planning. So it's passed both of those hurdles, which was also part of our Part of our discussion. Any so we have Q and A for CPA applicants, but I don't see any CPA applicants. So can we move on? Um, funding round. Funding round debriefing. So anything um, that struck you as well done, poorly done? Modifications. Tony, for, for since you're new, usually after we do a funding cycle, we look back at the previous funding cycle and say, how did how did our process go? So, Linda, you you watched it from afar. But <laughs> does anybody have specific thoughts? Did we have more time this time to consider conditions that? part of the process work better. The only thing I found difficult was um, the one long night where we went to what, quarter of 11 or 11 or something. By the time 10 or 10.30 rolls around, I don't feel like I'm in the best shape to make coherent decisions. And again, I don't know if there's a way to have divided that up, I'm just 
afraid that for some of us who are sleep deprived, after 10 o'clock, our bedtime begins to fade quickly. <clears throat> making rational decisions. And I think a three and a half hour meeting is tough. And I, I know sometimes it has to happen. And they like proposals, so that's, this was somewhat of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with you, Brian, I'm kind of the same mindset. But I don't like the feeling that I don't care as much at the yes. end of the meeting as I do at the beginning yes. of the meeting. And you know, I fight it and you fight it and you fight it, but mm -hmm. it's sort of human nature when you get up at five. And yeah. But it's tough, I think. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if there's any way around it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, I I guess we could we could start earlier. Yeah. Consideration yeah. nights. I mean, I don't know. That's in terms of exceptional basis. The committee scheduling. If we could start, it, we could start at six. I mean, we started the public comment meeting at six. Yeah. So that's one way to solve that problem. Because yeah, I think it, if we have that many proposals, I mean, it's this time. Maybe that's the solution. <clears throat> Okay. Um, and the other thing that we can do is just leave ourselves more time, and that means we move, right? We can move again, move things up a week to allow ourselves more time. So, um, so do that earlier in the round so we're not pushed up against the council decision. Considering what this last round looked like and how difficult it was to get through all of those, and, and in the beginning I thought it was going to be home. You know, I, I thought we came through it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I appreciated the flexibility and trying to figure out a way to get through it well, and I think we, we did. I, I don't know if um, City Council understands that we we solved our own problem as best we could and that we'll be in a different situation this spring, you know, than they're used to mm -hmm. seeing. Yeah, right. That, you know, that, that won't happen until they see the projects from us. But. Right. Uh, all right. Any other comments on that? David? Yeah, how about this, this lumberyard issue is ongoing, and um, because I thought it was a great project, under a crowd of our support for it, um, and it, it seems as though the, the decision not to support it so far in the, the city council level have nothing to do with city ordinances, and that that gets to a point of, of me sort of wondering about. What the value of our work is, if if uh, um, something totally conforms all city ordinances, and yet, uh, and we put a lot of time into um, deliberation about it, um, and um, I wonder if, if um, I mean, is there, is there any reason we're talking about the, the request for a uh, uh, city councilor to uh, spend time with us, talking with us about? our rationale for making a recommendation or, or it just it, it seems as though we spent all that time and, and it was it was uh, they faced a couple of um, very uh, um, strong um, opponents to the project and uh, uh, because of that because of the level of, of the tenor of, of the opposition turned it down and uh, that to me not how city government is supposed to work I mean, there's supposed to be a process to it and, and go through that deliberately and <coughs> in great deliberation and, and back and forth and then it gets cut down because somebody else. Um, yeah, I did my best to represent us and to explain yeah, to them the process. But, I'm sure you did, yeah. but no, but I but I think that it is um, in, in this instance it, I think it would be because again, one of the things that our I think our process was was misrepresentatives in some respects uh, in terms of the fact that the committee did in the end vote unanimously um, I mean we, and we had one vote that was invalidated which I think Glenn voted and then so the vote didn't count this time but, but I, I think there was unanimity but because we take the job seriously we grappled with some of the potential drawbacks some of the potential issues and impacts and I think that there was a, an attempt to focus on those and saying that we weren't enthusiastic for the project. You know, we, we weren't really supporting it. We, begrud we begrudgingly um, supported it. And as the chair, I can, you know, also our minutes were conveyed to council. So as the chair, I don't, it's hard for me to try to represent each one of you individually um, in terms of what exactly your thoughts were. I mean, I, I watched the consideration 
again in full, and um, so that if someone asks me a question specifically, I could be fair. Um, but I think that if we do have a decision like this that you know you feel like the process isn't understood, then I think an email um, or a letter to council um, or coming to public comment you know, would be would be helpful in terms of helping that. Well, council will kick it around too, but at the end of the day, they'll come to a real decision and. And you vote, you vote your opinion, obviously. Right. So, if somebody had a lot of questions along the way, it doesn't mean that they you know, that their support for a for a yay vote is is, is um, lukewarm. It just means that they were trying to inform themselves uh, prior to their vote. So, right. I hope that none of our questioning uh, each other, uh, which at times was the tail, would be taken as, uh, as, as 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 lukewarm support for the project. In, in the end. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I would hope not, and I represent them that we take the process of evaluation seriously. That's why we did that. Um, you know, again, to be fair to council, they haven't voted. Nobody's voted on this. So, mm -hmm. vote, you know, there's zero votes against and zero votes, I mean, other than expression of, of uh, someone being, you know, Council Carney being not ready to vote for it at that meeting. Um, they're, they're going forward to February 5th, so that's the decision. And you'll be there February 5th. You, Vice Chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah! <laughs> no, I'll, walk be, I'll, be, I'll be there February 5th. But I would welcome any of you to, you know, any of your support. Again, public comment is at the beginning, so I usually have to wait around until they get to me in the agenda. But, you know, again, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's very hard for the council, as as much as we can send them. And I don't know how many of them actually watch our, you know, it was pretty easy. I mean, it was long. I think it ran almost an hour of discussion. Um, but it's right up there on NCTV. You can watch it on YouTube. It's available. So there shouldn't be any mystery as to exactly where our discussion was. But again, sometimes it's easier for them to hear it from your mouth and sometimes more powerful. So. Uh, I've already got it on my calendar, so I'll be there. Yeah, and, I don't, and I don't know whether... Again, you know, I think of committees as usually operating by a vote and a resolution that we send forward, and I don't want, necessarily want to confuse things by having like a, you know, sheet that we would send, a recommendation sheet where we say, oh, this is my personal comment, because I think, again, then you vie for which comments are most valid. But, um, and it feels fine to me that they debate it. I mean, they're spending, yeah. I mean, it, right. it, they, feels, they have the power. it feels like the process, mm. you know, it's working. Right. We recommend and they appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, that moves us to the round one 2015 application review schedule. So, thanks for coming in, sir. Mm -hmm. Question down? Absolutely. It wasn't clear to me from our higher deliberations whether or not the intent was that we were going to be waiving this round with the exception of expedited processing that may be requested given how much we had spent down. Um, I, I didn't hear us make a decision on that. We didn't make a decision, but I raised, I, I remember saying something along that line. I mean, I, I guess that, I, mean, I guess I'll let other people speak to it, because what I, what I heard was that we had decided to go past our previous guideline of spending 50%, that we recognized that there were projects on the table that might mean we spent 100%, in which case anybody that came in would expect to be, would have to be bonded. And at that point, I felt like, oh, we would have to make some kind of decision. But since we did end up with nominally, nominally spendable money, even though we know that there's a lot of project out there that we've seen before. There's uh, about 180000 Right, that's what I thought. If, if, if the 300000 is approved for the long run? If it is, yes. Would there be 180000 right. yes. for this round? So I don't know what anyone else would think about our posture in this round. Do we want to make a decision? Yeah, I, 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 I,
decision at this point about, you know, we had any expression of interest from applicants? Uh, historically, Hampton is planning to come in um, not with a capital project, but with a project to make historic information accessible, uh, repairs to the Seth Thomas Clock, conservation fund, possible land acquisition, and repairs to the Union Street Jail. And repairs to the? The Union Street Jail. Oh, and the Which we know about. So. And did uh, Look Park restoration come back for us? Low Park did not, though, in my conversation with their director, Sean, um, we talked about scheduling, and he he expressed their intent to come back in the fall when we would be into a new fiscal year and more likely to have funds. You know, he, he recognized that we were financially limited after mm -hmm. the grants we made, right. um, and so he thought that they would work on lining up their fundraising their campaign and come back to us with their application the fall. Was that with knowing that we would have some money in the spring and we would do a cycle? Um, at that point, at that point, no. At that point, no. So I think that in looking over the eligibility sheets, um, they, it, there were, um, I'm not sure what the budgets will be, obviously, Pulaski Park will exceed our budget, but things like the conservation fund, the conservation purchase, a lot of those are scalable. Uh, we've already seen the clock project. This is just the, this is going to be an application for that additional $10,000 that wasn't given. Um, so that fits under our budget. And uh, the Union Street jail steps, I don't know what they would be, what they would be asking for. But that, that could potentially be a large, large project. So, is that an unsatisfactory non-answer? No, <laughs> it's an answer. Yeah. I, I just wasn't clear. I, I thought the intent was to you know, spend down so that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a, another round, but we would be considering one large project in reserve to the next right. rounds. That, that was my interpretation. Mm -hmm. But if we have people coming in and we've got money, then I mean, my only concern would be the timing of the last Park application. <coughs> whether or not we're going down the road with some of these other, I mean, if it's ill-timed, then there may be... So Plasky Park is in as a regular application. Oh, no, so it's not. It's not expedited. So they gave us an eligibility form. Well, I was surprised. They gave us an eligibility form, and I talked to Sarah about it, and apparently they're comfortable with our appropriation being made, and, you know, before July 1st when their money Good. comes back. So then Park Grant has a problem. How much is that for again? <coughs> does not say on the eligibility uh, form. Well, they, they don't doesn't say on the eligibility form, um, though they there is a clue that it may be larger because they they referenced undergrounding utilities. So so doing additional undergrounding utilities, which they've done partially, um, but that's gonna be another that's usually expensive. So uh, but and I know that they have so correct me if I'm wrong, they have 95% drawings now. They do. Yeah. So they're to the 95% drawing stage, so we should be able to get a very good idea of what we intend to build. Can you remind me, was it our intention of having the clock be positioned in an area that would be harder included in the, in the Pulaski Park? Uh, I, I think we said the public. I, public I think it was, place, it was so yeah, like, prominently, prominently displayed. So I think it's specifically to play. Yeah. The okay. preferred location of the, the planning department, and I, I think the DPW would be Pulaski Park, but the committee is required somewhere downtown. Right. And it's visible. Yeah. We don't want to tie their hands in case another <coughs> better place became available, but we did want it to end up downtown as a huge problem. Yes. The only reason I mentioned that is that there should be some structure built in at the time of the redo and plus that's no but yeah they were they were intending to do that in the plan so that was part of it if if it were going to be in the plus yeah yeah all right so now we are to um, the schedule and we've seen this before and provided some input but now is your opportunity 
Um, so eligibility sheets are already in. Um, tonight is our question and answer for applicants. And apparently they're satisfied with the transparency of our materials. Because they're not here. Um, then we have our meeting dates. So I threw the February 4th meeting in thinking that we would probably have an expedited review. Okay. Um, since we don't have one, unless we have a lot to do on contracts and small projects, we won't really have anything to do that meeting. Which is fabulous news because I'm not able to make the fourth. So this we have no February meetings? It would. With the exception of potentially a site visit? Yep. So I will say that one of the issues in terms of meeting length and in getting the committee's business done is that we don't we don't get business done at meetings where we're having applicants present or we're doing decision making. So small grants, contract template review, anything administrative just it doesn't get done. I mean Sarah bravely puts it on the agenda, but when I take the temperature of the committee as to whether we would all like to stay around at 9.30 and do an extra hour of administrative work. Since I value my additional salary that I receive as chair, I let you all go home. Um, so that's why, and again, summer is the same thing, right? Summer, people tend to be right, in and out. And so again, I think if we want to take that seriously, um, we do need to have some of these extra meetings, um, which if February is bad, then then I would think that May 20th would be a meeting that we should mark off in our calendars as being an administrative meeting before people slip away and we get to a summer schedule. Is, it, is this February 4th bad for anybody else? Anyone else? I'm okay. And what would we do on the 4th? So on the 4th, um, I think that it would be good. We've had a number of things like template contract and small grants. Um, we've been doing 40 minutes on them about seven times. Because every time we do 40 minutes and then we come back to it three months later, we forgot what we've done in 40 minutes. So I think that the idea would be to leave that meeting with a small grants idea done. And leave with the template done. So. You know, it might be an hour on each one, or an hour and 20 minutes on each one, so it'll be a real meeting, but it would be, you know, we feel like we had moved forward and disposed of those items. So that's a good idea. Dave, are you in a place where you, you're ready to move forward with this one? I think we can start the discussion, and I can have some things for people to discuss, but given how diverse the opinions were, the last time we talked about this substantively, I would think that we would probably need another meeting to incorporate people's comments and finalize them for that in favor of moving it forward as opposed to fishing. I, I mean, I guess in terms of the, I, I know that we have a lot of different visions, but um, in some sense, if, if, our, if our visions are too diverse, that they, then maybe we shouldn't have it. Right? I mean, maybe it's not something that the committee wants to buy into. And I kind of want to, as chair, force everybody to you know, come to some consensus, again, because this, it, we've now gone through multiple rounds where we've had no, right, we had, you know, we haven't had small grants, we haven't had or a small grants procedure. So, you know, we're, we're, I like people to give comments, but I would think that um, we should be pretty close. If you, if you could send out materials in advance, and I'll try to put together, you know, my notes and I can meet with you, um, if we could send out in advance so people could come ready to basically narrow things down, um, like make the, pre make, make the presentation outside of the meeting, and then the meeting is dragged. I'll kind of do my best with the caveat that I don't know what my work schedule is. Yeah, and you can no, kick no. whatever you want to me. So. so that would be the February 4th meeting, and I apologize if past that. And then we'll know how to do the... But it served me well if yeah. you send it around. Right, exactly. So if we can get your comments, then we can do and I'll have to do contracts for the previous round, too. Yes. yes. Um, 
All right, so that's February, and then in March we have a meeting with applicants. A single meeting should be sufficient with the number of applicants we have. Um, a public comment session. Now, again, here we have two, only two, actually only one and a half consideration meetings because we're having public comment, which may not, which won't be nearly as extensive, I would guess, as this pass round. But um, do we wish, if we wish to avoid crushing everything into one and a half meetings, um, we could either set a meeting for April the 8th, um, or we could set a meeting for April the 22nd. Would you consider combining the meeting with applicants and the public comment? I think those go together well. I think the people, you know, as long as it's publicized that that's what we're going to do with that meeting, I think in some ways it offers a dialogue between the applicants if, if they want to ask, you know, some, sometimes the public comment raises questions and they're there to answer the questions. Um, the only problem administratively with that I see is that you have public showing up and wanting to get their get their public comment done. Mm -hmm. So they really wouldn't be able to, so, but if you wanted the benefit of having them viewing the presentations, you'd have to do the presentations first. So I think, I mean it might work since we have such a short list, but if we started, if we started at six, I don't know how many people would, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to have the, the two sides sort of waiting around for a long time. Okay. Um, but I don't know. Okay. Thanks about it. So it'd be nice, but I think I, I hear what you're saying. I think I've Applicants seem to like to know exactly when to come, especially if they have consultants and they're right. paying to come from out of the area. Uh, okay. It seems to me it should not be problematic this this round. This round. Um, so I think in that case, um, well, what if we did this? What if we had a meeting with applicants and we had public comment on that night and then we could have another public comment meeting actually noticed for the 18th? So anybody who, right, we wouldn't expect the same numbers. We might expect nobody. And obviously, if, but that way we'd have two opportunities for public comment rather than just dropping that second Tag. Is that yes? No. I think that's a good question. So, I'm sorry. So I'm saying the March 4th meeting, what that was suggesting is that rather than having the public comment session standing alone, <coughs> we wanted to move it up with the meeting with applicants. And in case you had you know, meeting, and I think it's only fair to the applicants to put them on the agenda first. So to say 7 o'clock, you're presenting, 720 you're presenting. If we have people who don't want to sit through an hour and a half of presentations, I'd like to indicate in the schedule that public comment is welcomed at that March 4th meeting, but also leave on the schedule public comment session for March 18th as well. So and the public comments would not begin until 8.30 or 9.00 or something. Well, that's what I'm, you know, I just don't want that to be, some people would be happy to hear the presentations and then that informs a public comment, but some people might just want to be here and be done, so. Um, so then we would start the meeting March 18th and our agenda would reflect that. And we could also try to inform people through the website that on the 18th, if you wanted to be here, make your comments and then leave, that, that you could do on the 18th. And if you come on the 4th, then you would, you'd have to wait, you'd listen first. Um, and then we begin our recommendations on the 18th and go to completing them on April 1st. Now again, um, we have complete council orders with conditions on May 6th. So if we're comfortable that 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 you know that we usually like to have all of our things, we'd like to have all of our recommendations wrapped up before we get to that meeting. So again, if we're comfortable with doing our full consideration in what will now be one and three quarters meetings, then we'll do with that. Okay. Right. Any, Any other, other questions? 
seems like no, I think so. Yeah, there's not that. I don't think we're going to get overwhelmed. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I would just say we could we could sort of all write in our calendars April eighth or April twenty second. You know, if if we needed it, because obviously we did get into a situation in this last round where we shifted and added a meeting. I don't see the harm in that. Putting it down tentatively. Do we have a do we have a preference? I would prefer not to have a month between our completion of our recommendations and our council orders. If, if only because a month is a long time to potentially forget everything that we've talked about or okay. conditions yeah. or you know those types of things. It seems like, especially if we have folks who are interested in using the money or kind of other obligations to do, the sooner we make that recommendation, the better, if we can. Do we, well, um, do we wish to, and again, this is dependent on people's schedules, do we, we can move that meeting to April, either April the 8th or April the 22nd? That? We can have it during April break if people are going to be around. It, in the past, no one has been, so we've yeah. sort of done it that way. I am not going to be here, but during that during that break, but well, I'll you put twenty third April. So the Wednesday is April the twenty second. Yeah. So that would be two weeks. All right. So let's let's leave May sixth on as a meeting. Um, Sorry, you can just send this out yeah. so, so we'll move complete council orders with conditions up to April the 22nd. We'll leave the 6th in your calendars as a regular business meeting, but if we don't have anything to do, then we will not hold it. Can I go back to February 4th for a second? Yes. Are, are we planning to do the contract stuff tonight? Um, template. So tonight we'll do the, the template if we can, and then I'll use the template to develop the contracts for what we wanted last round, and then we can look at those next meeting. My, my concern is just my work schedule before February 14th, because I'm looking at my calendars. I'm going to be in Boston next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and have some hearings on the 2nd and 3rd of February. So my time to pull that stuff together for a February 4th meeting is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have to have that done, we don't have to have anything formalized during this round, there's nothing pressing. I would just assume either schedule something later in February instead of February 4th or hold it till the May 6th or work it in when we can. Well, um, why don't we just, we could set it as May 6th, right? I mean, it doesn't benefit us to get it done earlier than that because it's not going to be rolled out until fall of next year anyway. Yeah. And I can still forward things around when it right. takes the pressure out from the field. Okay. So then May 6th is now small grants extravaganza. Uh, so we've added the 22nd of April. We've added the 22nd of April. Does that mean we're asking the 4th? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. The 4th of February we are coming back. Um, and the 4th of February, I would expect everybody, since you just got the contract template, um, we would be bringing back that template for final tweaking if necessary, or it will be tweaked by then, so you'll get to read it at that point. I'll have sent it out in advance. And then we have to review and approve our contracts for the last round that we funded. So what do you need for quorum for the fourth? Because I, I won't be voting on contracts. You can't you know, you can't vote on the con you can't vote on the contracts with the template though. Template, so yeah, template you can participate in that. But that's discussion. three you're missing for the fourth. So we have still have a quorum. Okay. Well, yes. Everybody on the side of the room? All right. So the so the schedule is now good. And I will revise. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next item is the.
contract template that was sent to you. And I printed some out. I would, love, I would love a copy so I can. <laughs> okay, so um, so I'll just try to go down through um, most of the changes that you see in the red line version that Sarah has given you were trying to harmonize a lot of it is just the name what we call various parties um, and this all started as the form contract from the city when they buy anything and so there was vendor and city um, and so then in some paragraphs it had been changed to grant or grantee um, and some it was agreement versus contract versus grant, uh, and so a lot of it was just trying to make it consistent throughout. Uh, in some cases, I did move some things around, um, because what we had done is also we took the, we took the city contract and then we stuck on at the end a part that was relevant to the CPA. And I took some of that stuff that was relevant to the CPA and moved it into the body of the contract because it was um, it was critical stuff. So, for instance, um, in, the, in the paragraph beginning, city shall pay grantee up to, that that's pretty important stuff because it talks about how payments will be dispersed, and that was stuck back in the CPA portion, but I thought it belonged up front. So. And remind me, the city solicitor has seen this, will see this? The city, so the city solicitor will see it. Um, there is not, um, there is not a lot of, I don't think that any of the changes I made were, I did, I moved stuff around. I tried, and of course, once, um, once you all have looked at this, then I have to read it from scratch and make sure that my moves had not created the problem. But it was mostly moving things and changing the names of things. Um, and you know, as best I could, when suggestions were made that either um, increased our rights or decreased our rights, I tried to research them. And the, so for instance, Linda had brought up this, seeming, um, this seemingly strange requirement that when you sign a contract, you need to check that there are no unpaid taxes and they need to sign you know, on the dotted line and say, in fact, um, I certify under penalties of perjury that I have in my, this is a second page near the bottom pursuing the Master General Laws Chapter 62C, Section 49A. That's actually required by that Master General Law that, that is in every contract signed between a municipality and anybody. So the legislature decided in their wisdom that that was going to be the place where they were going to recover well, And for money. things like that, I take some satisfaction that the solicitor will read it through before we actually prepare on that. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, but that is, I mean, I read that and was like, you, you can't, right. It's, it's, right, it's right in the statute. So you can't take that out. Um, We've gotten some back taxes, I think. Yes, yes, yes occasionally. Okay. Okay. Not being a lawyer, I feel particularly capable of um, rendering an opinion on most of this. And, and I, I would, you know, frankly, um, one, we've seen both city solicitor uh, before I uh, and get an opinion before so I is. even have an opinion on it. Is, are there are there sort of non legalistic issues that, that find are all the typos? Yeah, you find all the you know that's right. I, I can do that. I mean, find all the typos. Find all the you know I'm good at proofreading antecedents yeah. that are unclear, and that's a lot of it. But you, but the the, the one that um, the version that uh, Sarah was kind of forward. It looks like this, or it had a bunch of red markups, and yeah. that one surely had been through your word 
software, so it, it, it has gotten its uh, been cleaned, right? Um, well, I took two Redline versions from Linda and Dave and sat down with them and added them all into my document and tried to make sure that, you know, as best I could, um, I reflected their changes. Um, there were things that were repeated over and over again, like I think we had three or four claims that they would, we would be indemnified against harm. Um, and, I, you know, maybe the solicitor or the procurement officer thinks that we should have all four, but it seemed like, you know, if, if one would be sufficient. Um, there were, I'm trying to think, is... Can I respond to this? Yes. Just, um, when I read this, which was one of the first things that I did when I, when I came on the committee, I, I was kind of scratching my head and saying, well, clearly there were the, the references that kept changing to it, but I was trying to put myself in the shoes of a grantee saying, okay, well, this is, this is what's telling me what the rules of the game are. Do I, after having read this, do I understand and think I know what the rules of the game are? And, I, and my conclusion was, I don't have a clue, you know, what I'm supposed to do, what happens if I don't do it, mm -hmm. you know, do I have a restriction, do I not have a restriction? So, to answer your question of what you should do, it's great that you're not a lawyer. I think you should read it and say, if I'm coming here as a grantee and I've asked for money, and I'm not paying a lawyer to tell me what this says, because I don't have the money, I, you know, do I understand it? So I, I think you actually could read it with a very my, my, useful eye. My very primitive knowledge of law is going to leave to expose me to <coughs> law, and then... Don't the, say something unkind here. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. No, no, uh, quite, no, not at all. Uh, but then, then the, uh, the, the dialogue that went on behind the scenes is, is part of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the the law writers in order to reach the law that they that they produced um, so that it so as to explain the intent of the law and, and I've seen that in, in Federal Register um, so is if if the city requires a certain legal document um, I would be, hopefully it'll be in as, as common English as possible, but they still don't require a certain legal document. But if we, well, your, your point seems like a very good one to me, but I don't know if they're the same document, whether they a statement of procedures and obligations and rights and so forth, might be a separate document from the actual legal contract that the petitioner has to, or the applicant has to, has to, um, has to sign in order to get the money. Is that, is that, can we make something that's in common English and is acceptable to the city solicitor? Um, I, you can ask two different lawyers to, to address the same topic and they will read differently. There's certainly, a, you know, there's certainly boilerplate, there's certainly some things that are that are terms of art and so forth, mm -hmm. but um, some people can write things in a way that's trying to communicate and some people have a very different purpose in writing it. So I, I think there is, there, there are limits, but I think you can, to some extent, make a document more user-friendly than another and still have the same legal effect. And they, I would say there's certain, there are certain things, um, there are certain things regarding protecting the city against liability that the city really doesn't care what we think. And, and, and you know, and they may, and, you know, boilerplate as indecipherable has the benefit of it having been interpreted by a court before. Whereas when you come up with plain language, um, exactly. the court has got to start from scratch. But everything that's everything that's related to what we want um, out of this. So, for instance, if, you know, if you look down the third page, um, the payment of funds. So that's how how do we get our money back if we if Sarah finds an invoice that says, oh, it was spent for a limo ride. Um, monitoring. Right, that's annual preservation guarantee certification. So that has, the city really doesn't care about that. That's, that's CPC, we want that. Um, the same thing with guarantees. The same thing with Preservation Act awareness, permanent recon, you know, recognition. I mean, those are things that I think you can think of um, as well as you know, the last paragraph um, reports before the signature blocks start. I mean, that's um, just a, 
Dave and I were talking about this paragraph the other day, and we had we had each year until the completion of the project, the grantee shall provide us with a written update of progress, um, a final report including photo documentation is due not later than 30 days. Um, Dave mentioned that when Pro Food Remote Hampton came in, that they were you know, asking for budget adjustment or you know, recognition of, of their spending to date. But they also gave us an oral presentation on what what they've done. And they thought that was pretty good because otherwise the reports come in and they're a document that gets stuck in the file with the rest of the documents. Can we make that a requirement? So so we added this here, and again it's up to you all as a committee to decide do you want that in there? We basically said if we want a request, then we can have them come in. And you know, we try to coordinate so we get three or four people in here on a night. And again, sort of closing closing the loop and having some recognition. And if we can get you know, Chad came in here to report, then it's not just that the council approved an appropriation, but a contract actually went out and the project was completed. So, um, so as you read through, I would look at all, all of those things. And also think of, is there something that's been missed? Is there something that you think is part of what we do that, that we should obligate the grantee to do? So with that said, is there anything to people uh you may need the mayor in here that which is a uh, a, a moment in time. I mean uh, along with the mayor and all that, but because it's gonna be a long term document. Is it appropriate to name the mayor? Um yeah, I mean we can put that in brackets, but yeah, it would be definitely there are some things that we would change so we can just say by blank it's mayor. Um, if you have comments right now, I can jot them down. Um, but yeah, email comments are great. And then we'll again integrate them and send it out to you. Um, and I'll, I'll send you both Redline and clean copies. Because so. I find it absolutely impossible to read Redline documents. <laughs> it's helpful. It's helpful, but, but you can't figure out what's going on. The third time through, through it helps. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so I think what I'll have to do as far as the specific contracts goes, rather than trying to use a, a draft of a draft, I'll just send out the specific uh, conditions that I started for discussion for each project. Because I, I can't really work with the template that hasn't been approved yet. I, I'm too afraid I would lose something. Mm -hmm. But I know some of the grantees are starting to change again going. Right. Are we finished on, on, this, on the contract discussion? Because I was the latest point, but it's not a contract mm -hmm. okay, um, the issue, and, and the issue of making us friendly to applicants. Um, it struck me that there have been, I mean, I've listened over the years to a number of people who've spoken about con about projects, um, especially in opposition projects. Um, there have been a lot of times when people have spoken about issues that are unrelated to what we are mandated to look at and, and consider. And, and it's always a little heartbreaking because I value their opinion, but I also realize they're spending time and, and hope talking about things that we don't control. Um, and and I was wondering if, um, if the statewide uh, association or if any other um, uh, civic associates, uh, other CPC might have developed guidelines for people who are raising questions or, or you're making comments to CPCs. Now they're just sort of saying, if you've got a comment on, on a project for the CPC, you know, it's going to be most helpful if you can find your, your comments to these areas because, you know, we don't really control how tall a building is if it, uh, if because that, that's a zoning issue and, and we don't really control this, but we certainly do, you know, we are we are interested in following kinds of uh, questions. It just, is, is that, that's, that, I mean, that speaks to efficiency and friendliness, and, and I think we reduce frustration on the part of citizens. It's a little tough because every CPC is different, and some some CPCs would see that as their role. And if we wanted to develop something like that, then 
Certainly. But you haven't heard of anything. No. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else feel that way? I guess not. Okay. Oh, I think that's part of the process. I understand mm -hmm. it is a filtering process that we have to kind of take in, but I mean, public comment is just that. And to try and narrow what their opinions may be or you know, their thoughts may be, I think, is a, is a follow order. I think it could be appropriate to, um, at the beginning and maybe at the conclusion of the evening, just have a comment about, you know, that ultimately, you know, we've heard everything you said, however, it's in this, you know, this is the framework within which we make our decisions and our evaluations, just to kind of remind people, like, mm -hmm. we've heard you, and I think you're right, it is a process, and um, it seems like people really need to be heard, so. I feel like we went a long way in cleaning up the instructions for how to get into the system and be a project. I mean, we worked on those. I think that's showing up as a cleaner process, simplified mm -hmm. and straightforward. So I think some of the questions we used to get were about that itself. Yeah, I mean, I think you can <coughs> reference people to the CPC plan if there's some confusion as to what process is or what bounds us. But I imagine that many people don't come here knowledgeable about the parameters in which we work. They just hear their project. Yeah, I just thought it would be helpful. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to put down on comment. I'm, I'm trying to reduce the frustration of petitioners who may comment only to us say that's not really what we deal with. I mean, that, that's frustrating for a citizen. Um, but uh, but I, I, I take all of your comments to heart. Well, typically, um, Kevin Lake on the Conservation Commission will point out to people that's not within our purview. So if they're talking about a zoning issue and we're not we're administering this, I think what Sarah said is difficult in that we really don't have, statute doesn't tell us what to do. The statute says you have to work within these program areas, but you all as a community determine mm -hmm. what and how you wish to do it. And um, I think, you know, I. I've done a lot of looking at our plan. Um, I think our plan is pretty good in listing what we act on and also being specific in saying that you don't have to jump through all of these hoops. Right? This is the list of things that we consider and maybe you'll satisfy all of them. That's great, but if you satisfy some of them, that's also adequate. So um, it's one, one thing that, um, Sarah, I don't know, we have, when the eligibility, when the applications come in, do we generally do a press release of, I know we do a press release after making recommendations. Do we do a press release when they come in? Because I do want people to, you know, again, I do want people to be informed that applications are moving through the process. So I've, I've done them before the public comment meeting. I yeah. don't think that's ever been picked up though. But I, I said that as a list too. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were, you know, some of the comments around, some of the comments around our, our projects are that it's, you know, it's never been heard of. But again, I found in, it's it's almost impossible to satisfy people, whether you know, on conservation commission or school committee, as much outreach as you try to do. Which doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do more. So if we can, um, maybe I can call. The Gazette and inform them that the community feels like sometimes they don't hear about these before they hit public comment, which is not necessarily, you know, you don't want to, if they read about our recommendation, then they're stuck having to go to city council and argue against our recommendation, which then doesn't feel fair if it's already moved forward. So if the Gazette would run something, it'd be nice to have, because they have an online presence, it would be nice to have a link and stuff for them. Right. I don't think it's right. realistic for us to hand these out, you know, it's a dense yeah. thing, but just to continue to point people back to this, because this is quite accessible to right. a lay person. So. All right, so. I have a couple of comments. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm sure on page three where it says payment terms, and then that's all marked out for the, did that get moved and I just can't follow it? Um, Yes, payment terms moves up to the the paragraph on the 
It's front the, page. Go ahead. Yeah, the front page. City shall pay. Right. So payment terms, as the title comes out, do you need the title to come up with it? It's you, you could. Okay. I mean, it's um, some of it makes more sense if you look at it in the digital document. What you know? What what happened was that the um, and and again, this is a valid comment, but. The standard terms and conditions for CPA projects, we use headers for our paragraphs. The city, paragraph, the city did not. Right. So when I moved it forward, I didn't pull that style. Okay. So, you know, that's a that's to, to your taste as to whether you think it's helping. I mean, some people really like it. They, Seems like some, it ought to be one way or the other, but not a combination. Right. The other question was uh, on the on the near the end where this vendor signs it. It says right variance to include direct payment to landowners, payment to grantees, payment to third parties. So, um, yes, so when we acquire, um, when we acquire land, there's a question of does the, you know, do we want the appropriation check to go directly to the landowner? Do we want it to go to an intermediary party before it's dispersed? And so, there was, um, you know, there was some attempt to try to deal with all three of those alternatives at once, mm -hmm. um, which becomes confusing because two of the things are not happening in the particular contract. So I just said, when we write it, if A is buying, you know, if A agency is buying the property from B person, then we write that up. So that's covered in the general paragraph in front of it, land that. Yes. Well, it would be. It would actually be just the. Um, yeah, it would. It would be the direct payment to landowner. I mean, when you write a contract, you say a check for one hundred thousand dollars will be written to, and you identify the party. Right. Uh, <coughs> their address, and so that would just be that land acquisitions. All that language survives from version to version, but its variant is just exactly how is the money going to be transferred. So, so that in two typos is all I thought in reading. Okay. And you don't want the typos now or the language stuff. You want that later, correct? Um, typos are much easier if you have a hard copy to circle and correct than it is to descri describing a typo. Yeah, so we don't want to take committee time. Just yeah. So you can just mail it, mail it to me, mail it to Sarah. Okay. And I'll so the earlier you get the comments to me, the earlier that I can make changes and then pass this on to the solicitor so that I can get comments from the solicitor and Joe Cook. And that means the farther when I bring it back to you, like when David says, have the power to be or the, you know, the legal brain trust for the city seeing this, I'll be able to say yes. And then we can vote on something ahead of them. Yeah, you're trying to um, circulate a, a not marked up copy? Yes, I have. Um, I can email it to you right now. Why collect our typos? What's that? Collect our typos and then email it? And I'll, we'll all give it another read? Your, your preference. If you've already marked them off. Yeah. And next yep. All right. Any other thoughts? Fascinating contract. Huh? Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, thank you to. I think it's come a long way. I mean, really, it it was indecipherable when we started. Uh, <laughs> no, I can even understand. Yeah. Even. Even me. But I've always found interesting about contracts is often they're written by people who have never, people who don't engage in litigation. And so the whole idea of a contract is to make it clear for potential litigation down the road. We have people who write contracts that have never litigated. So they write these contracts that are terrible, they're just, or they just make no sense. Well, and I can see why ours evolved from buying goods and services. Right. But right. Yeah. <laughs> 
for the other department, though. <laughs> Your department looks really bad when the contract blows up. So. Okay, so get your comments to me or Sarah, however you wish, and I will try to get um, those all aligned into the solicitor. I think that's it. Oh, no, financial overview. We have $180,000. Last year, the coalition, the CPA coalition, yes. was supposed to have had their spring annual meeting, meeting in Northampton. Oh, that never happened, and now we're urging on the spring of the following year. Did they ever communicate with us? They decided to have a Western Mass They didn't have a Western Mass at all. But they, don't, they generally don't. Have they ever had a Western Mass They had one here in 2010. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the meetings at which I was at, I was there, was there was concern about hey. the church and the uh -huh. window, and I just wondered where, where that issue was. Um, yes. I have heard no news. Yeah. Sarah had, we, we had informed Mass Historic that we wished to hear of action, should action be taken, and I don't. Not and I haven't heard anything from City Channel either. Do we have any updates on conflicts of interest and ethics training so that we can um, to repeat of our last incident? Uh, so I would. Um, A repeat yes. of oh, what? Dave? Well, just that we recognized the conflict sort of in mid process um, and then had to repeat discussion. So um, the ethics materials, I would encourage everyone to review the ethics materials. They're, you know, they're pretty straightforward. Um, it's well worth uh, looking them over. Um, I would encourage everyone, if you have any suspicion um, or any sense that there's a potential conflict, to call the attorney on duty at the Ethics Commission, because that is, you know, call them before you get deeper into the process because they're very helpful. And if you um, if you push them and you think it's some, on the line, um, then they will write a letter for you. Uh, and the, the letter basically then becomes part of their file as well, um, informing all, all other public officials of where those lines fall. Um, also, if you have a conflict and you wish to participate, because even though it's a presumed conflict, you think that you can participate, um, you can ask your appointing authority if you have one. Um, and so members of commissions, that would be the mayor. Um, or if you're appointed by city council, it would be the city council. Um, you can ask basically for them to okay your participation. But obviously, the earlier you do that, the better. Uh, so. Would it be possible, Tara, for you to send out any links to the state ethic commission's sure. office? Absolutely. And on Ourselves. And in the same vein, has Tony been submitted to open meeting law training? <laughs> oh, you're, you're part of it. Well, I, I've been on the North Hampton Housing Partnership and I'm on the board, so I think I'm on the board. So we do, um, this is, in terms of evaluating where we are in our process, I know that the um, Central Business Architecture Committee has um, received a letter uh, from an attorney retained by some of the abutters claiming that they did not follow, properly follow their procedures and granting approval to the design of the building. Um, so it's, you know, I think it, as, an administrative, as an administrative body, I don't, I don't know that, um, well, I know that CBCs have been sued before for acting not in compliance with the act. Um, I think it would be um, a, a stretch, but I could also see a CPC if you were uh, being sued for not adhering to its plan or abusing its discretion in making grants. So and I think that we have the obligation to avoid conflicts, to comply with open meeting, but also to, um, you know, that's why we invest so much time in having a good plan is that we, if we act in accordance with it, we're Along that line, the 
planning board received a on the, on the architect and town who provided a great deal of support for his comment by going around town and taking pictures and measuring distances of alleys. Who did that? I was going to do that. <laughs> well, my reaction to that is that was the correct way to uh, document your opinion right. about right. A criticism, and right. I would love to see us go in that direction for mm -hmm. for um, architectural decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, if there's no further business. Motion to adjourn. Second. Third. Sorry, sorry for next.